today we are hugely privileged to have mr charles bolden here to tell us about man's <coughs> space exploration he headed nasa the space agency which is in forefront of exploration of outer space with several scientific missions hubble space telescope has done magnificent job in expanding our knowledge of universe scientists have immensely benefited by the observations from the hst photographs of celestial bodies like galaxies and nebulas are breathtaking they have kindled interest of astronomy in common man we have with us today today mr charles bolden who took hubble space telescope from earth and installed in space we extend a very warm welcome to you sir thank you thank you good to be here I extend a hearty welcome to Ms Sara Greengrass political and economic officer Ms Sita Farrell international relations officer office of space and advanced technology and Ms Hemalata of American consulate and the students who have assembled here their teachers amateur astronomers science popular science popularizers and members of the media 3 2 1 We have ignition. We have liftoff. Liftoff of Columbia in mission 61C, and the shuttle has pulled the power. Major General Charles F. Bolden Jr. has launched into space aboard Columbia, Discovery, and Atlantis. Twice as a shuttle pilot, twice as mission commander. Now, after a lifetime of service and achievement, he's risen to the top position as the administrator of NASA. Bolden is the first African American to lead the space agency. and has been inducted into the Astronaut Hall of Fame. From 2009 to 2017, he oversaw the safe transition from 30 years of space shuttle missions to a new era of exploration focused on full utilization of international space station and space and aeronautics technology development. The agency's dynamic science activities under Bolden include unprecedented landing on Mars with Curiosity rover launch of spacecraft to jupiter and continued progress towards the 2018 launch of the james webb telescope which is a successor to the hubble space telescope uh, he studied bachelor of science degree in electrical science and later a master of science in systems management from the university of southern california he had a long and distinguished military career he flew over 100 combat missions and served as a test pilot for Naval Air Test Center Systems Engineering and Strike Aircraft Test Directorates. He served as an astronaut. That must be a very impressive thing for you all. And he traveled the orbit. He went around the Earth four times about the space shuttle. He served, um, he served as the assistant com commandant of midshipmen at the Naval Academy, as the commanding general of the Marine Expeditories Force in Kuwait, and also as the commanding general of the 3rd Marine Aircraft Wing. These are from the military listings. And he has been honored for his uh, contributions to this field. And uh, there is a long list of them. I would read only a few. Defense Distinguished Service Medal, Defense Superior Service Medal, Distinguished Flying Cross, Air Medal, three NASA Exceptional Services Medal, and four NASA Space Flight Medals, and so on. And he also received the National Space Trophy in 2014 and holds several honorary doctorate degrees from distinguished institutes. He was inducted into the U.S. Astronaut Hall of Fame in May 2006 and entrained into National Aviation Hall of Fame in October 2017. Today he serves as the president and CEO of the Bolden Consulting Group LLC. He serves as an independent director of the Lord Corporation and at last Air Wild Wing Hostings. So let us look forward to a very interesting lecture from the straight from the astronaut's mouth. Thank you. What I want to do today is talk to you um, not only about what I've done and how I got to be where I am, because I'm certain some of you may be interested in that. But more importantly, where I think you are going to go, or where you're going to have opportunities to go. I'm really happy to see so many young ladies here, because back home, I don't know whether it's National Women's Month here. Do you have such a thing? It's worldwide. 
All right, so we're celebrating World, His World Women's History Month, and uh, so it's good to see you all out because you're the wave of the future. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, let me do this while I'm thinking about it. Big day, get out your pens and papers. You don't have to do that. Put this in your mind, all right? 29th of March, big day, 29th of March. How many of you are familiar with what goes on on the International Space Station? You ever, uh, you ever go on the NASA website and watch astronauts as they go out and, and, and do spacewalks? No? Okay, on the 29th of May, 29th of March, that's this month, 29th of March, I recommend you go to www.nasa.gov and watch the spacewalk that's going to occur on that day. It'll probably be the middle of the night here for you, but on that day, we're going to have a historic spacewalk because for the first time, we'll have two female astronauts who are going to go out and do the spacewalk. So uh, I want you all to have an opportunity to see it. That's our planet, and that's what we call home. And as the title says on there, it's the only one we have. So one of the things that I want you all to understand as we talk with each other is that we really need to take care of this. We need to take care of our planet Earth. So this is a view from a million and a half kilometers away from Earth, taken with a, uh, an imaging satellite called Discover. That's a, it, 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 it's involved in meteorological studies, looking at long-term climate changes and climate effects, but also providing real-time data to meteorologists who do weather forecasts and the like. And then we were lucky in that we also captured this thing that's going around Earth, and it goes around Earth every 28 days. So what's that? It's our moon. And what's really special about it is we get to see the backside of the moon. It's an area that only a very few people have ever seen, and they were the Apollo astronauts. Because we don't, from Earth, we don't get to see the backside of the moon because it's rotating on its axis at the same rate that it's going around Earth, and we, we seem to always see the same side. The same side is always facing us. So this gives us an unusual opportunity to look at the backside of the moon. And now that the Chinese have actually landed uh, a lunar lander and have a rover, um, we can't see it with Discover, but we at least have a feel for where they are on the lunar surface as, so we can kind of follow them along as they do, do their research over the coming months. This is a, you know, that one was a, from a million and a half kilometers away. This is a little bit closer to home. So this one is taken aboard the shuttle Discovery in 1990, March of 1990, when my crew and I took the Hubble Space Telescope to space and we lifted it out with a remote manipulator system, a mechanical, an ar a remotely operated arm and put it into space. Um, we had a big IMAX camera. We had two on board, as a matter of fact, one in the cabin with us, but we also had one that was mounted in the back of the shuttle in the payload bay such that when the space telescope came out, we could image it as it went away from the shuttle, but then we had film left so we could image Earth on a few, for a few times. And so we really took this one. This is one of my favorite because it, it shows uh, the Middle East, uh, eastern, northeastern Africa, western Saudi Arabia, the Sinai Peninsula, Israel, Jordan, uh, a lot of other places there, and it gives you a feel for what I saw on my first space shuttle mission. So when I flew the first time aboard the shuttle Columbia in 1986, we launched on the 12th of June, 12th of December, 12th of January, I'll get it right. Um, and when you go to space, you're kind of laying there waiting for a couple hours, you know, for launch. And you, you don't have a lot to do. So you're kind of going over checklists, making sure you know what you're going to have to do. And you're talking to your crew members. And you're listening to the, to the answer, talk to the, to talk to the public. And all of a sudden, you, you, you come out of what we call a T-minus nine-minute hole. They take 10 minutes of break in the countdown at nine minutes so that all the engineers can talk to each other. They can check all the apparatus and all the computers and everything to make sure everything's good before they, before they start the countdown again. And so coming out of the T-minus nine-minute hole, we started the countdown. We could hear the announcer say, well, ladies and gentlemen, we're now at T-minus 20 seconds and counting. And then he says, we're now at T minus 15 seconds. And he gets down to, we're at T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. And when he said 7, all of a sudden we were laying there and we, we heard and felt this boom, boom, boom. 
and it was the three main engines on the shuttle igniting, and it caused the shuttle itself to kind of go like it was going to tip over. And because it's mounted uh, really with the two solid rocket boosters, we had eight bolts that were about that big around. That's all. And that's what held the seven, the four million pound shuttle up like on its tail. And so the bolts caught, we sprang back, the computers knew everything was okay, and it sent signals to two big solid rocket motors on the outside, and all of a sudden go, <laughs> we felt and heard this giant explosion, and <laughs> the vehicle just starts to vibrate, and you feel yourself sink back in your seat ever so slightly, and you're lifting off, and you can feel the vehicle literally roll around and go upside down as it starts on its journey to space. Eight and a half minutes later, you're in space. I mean, that's, that's all it takes. It's not hours, it's not days, it's eight and a half minutes. So eight and a half minutes from leaving the Kennedy Space Center, you're going 17,500 miles an hour, about 23,000 kilometers an hour, and you're on your way, going around Earth once every 90 minutes. So you see daylight for 45 minutes, darkness for 45 minutes. Daylight for 45 minutes, darkness for 45 minutes. And as you go around Earth, because the Earth is rotating beneath you, over the course of one day, you do 16 orbits of Earth, and the world rotates beneath you, and your orbit kind of does what we call precess, so you move. Each orbit goes farther west around the equator until you come back where you started. So in one day, you get to see every single, well, not the poles, but you get to see a lot of Earth over that, that one day period of time in 16 orbits. And when we first got there, um, I had done a lot of study of the continent of Africa because being a person of African descent, I wanted to be able to look at the, the various countries in Western Africa so that I could look for some of those from which my, my ancestors may have come. And I looked out the window about 15 minutes into the flight and there was the continent of Africa coming up. And I started to cry uh, because I was just overwhelmed, one, at seeing what I thought was an island and then recognizing the fact that no, that's the continent of Africa. But the reason, one of the reasons I cried was because this is what I saw. And what's missing in this picture? Huh? Borders. Somebody said it down here. I don't know who it was. No borders, no boundaries. So all the study I had done of African geography, you know, it, it was kind of like people think. And so I don't know why at the age of 39, I expected that I was going to see these lines on Earth, but I didn't. And so I realized that all my life I had gone around thinking that, you know, we're divided by these things that are just natural, and there aren't. So there, were no, there was no border between Morocco and Tunisia and Algeria or Nigeria and Ghana and everything. And I recognized right then that all these divisions that we, we tend to put on people, divisions of color, divisions of race, division, divisions of religion and ethnicity, uh, they're all things that we generate. And so that was the beginning of my quest to try to help people understand that we really do need to learn how to, how to collaborate better, to cooperate more, uh, to accept each other the way we are, and to try to work toward a common cause of making the planet better. Because as I said, it's the only one we got. We have one ocean. We live on one giant ocean. And in that ocean, bodies of land stick up that we now call continents or islands or whatever. And we have one atmosphere. In fact, for those of you who can see it, there's a very thin blue line right there. That's our atmosphere. Space, I mean, it's full of stars, but in the daytime, our sun is so bright that you can't even see the stars. So space is black in the daytime. At night, it flip-flops. The stars become brilliant. And I mean, you see gazillions of them out here. And then Earth kind of disappears, because unless you're flying over a, a heavily inhabited area that has a lot of wealth, there are not a lot of lights down on the Earth. So, so you get to see um, quite a difference between daylight and darkness. In darkness, you see the divisions on Earth, and you see the divisions due to wealth or lack thereof. The, the wealthy areas are all lighted and everything. You fly over areas like Paris or New Orleans, Louisiana, or New York City, and there, you can see the streets actually lined out. There's no evidence that people live down here except at night when you see these nice linear features that human beings have created. But other than that, if I were a Martian coming here and I got to this altitude, I'd turn around and go back. 
because I'd recognize that, oh, man, I picked the wrong planet. There's nobody down there. You know, I'm coming here to find intelligent life, and it doesn't exist. So you feel kind of insignificant at first, and then you realize how privileged we are to live on this, on this incredible planet. So that's, that was my first lesson. Um, how many of you have ever heard of Elon Musk? What does he do? CEO of SpaceX. He's actually the CTO, to be technical. I don't know why he doesn't call himself the CEO, but he, he considers himself to be the chief technical officer. So he's the chief designer and everything else. What does Elon want to do? Where does he want to go? Who does he want to take? Huh? A thousand people or more. Any of you want to go? All right, that's good. Any of you want to stay? That's not good. Okay, and, and, I, and I don't know, you may want to stay. I want you to come back. I think it's really, really, really critical for you to go to Mars, experience it safely, and then turn around and come back because it's important for you to do what I'm doing today. It will be important for you to share your experience with other kids in India who will be sitting in classrooms just as you are today, and you can tell them your story about the day you sat in a planetarium in Bangalore, uh, kind of dreaming about being an astronaut, but thinking that that's never going to happen to me. And, and I really did get to go to Mars. And you can do it too, because we need examples, and we need role models. And so that's what I want you all to do. I want you to think about today. How do you, how do you get to do that? And you may not want to go to space. You may not want to be an astronaut, but you may want to help us go to space. And we need engineers, we need scientists, we need mathematicians, we need cooks, we need accountants. And I've got a video, a piece of video I'm going to show you, and I want you to see all the different people who are in that video talking about how we conduct science at 240 miles above Earth every single day going 17,500 miles an hour. It takes all kinds of people, and that's, that's the big thing. That was the one thing about NASA that I loved, we were, not a, we were a technical organization, but we were not an organization of machines. We were an organization of people. About 18,000 people spread around the world trying to make the planet a better place on which to live. So this is our, this is our settlement today. When Elon talks about taking a million people or a thousand people or whatever it is to Mars and letting them live there, well, we live here right now. Human beings actually live and work on the International Space Station and have been doing so for more than 18 years. So for any of you in here who are 18 years or less, you have not taken a single breath in your entire lifetime when human beings have not been living and working on this thing called the International Space Station. For those of you who play football, it's, the, it's about the size of a pitch. So if you'd brought this down to Earth and landed it in the, you know, the biggest football stadium here in Bangalore, it would go about end zone to end zone. That's how big it is. It weighs about 100 million pounds, uh, and it's very expensive. So uh, it's really, it's, but it's an incredible laboratory for doing and seeing things off this planet where we take gravity out of the equation. And so that's what I'm going to show you a little bit about uh, as we go to the video later. This is it. So this is what goes on on the International Space Station today in terms of science and experimentation. You can leave the volume up, it's okay. Scott Kelly spent a year on the International Space Station with his colleague Mikhail Kornenko from the Russian Space Agency. We now maintain our fitness because we have incredible exercise apparatus on board. Astronauts used to go to space, come back after a week. They had lost muscle mass, bone mass. Today, they come back sometimes stronger than they were when they left because they exercise every single day. They eat well, they sleep, and uh, we take care of them.
as I told the group before this, you'll notice there's a flag missing in here. What is it? The flag of India should be in here. So you all have got to help me help you by encouraging your space agency, ISRO, to proceed with their human space flight program, but get engaged and start flying on the International Space Station, flying experiments and doing things like that. So, um, so that's, that's what's going on today. NASA some time ago, though, when I was a NASA administrator working for President Obama, um, we had been, word had been, or instructions had been given to us by the Congress and the American people after we lost the Space Shuttle Columbia in 2003. And we said, you know, um, we want to go farther than just low Earth orbit. We want to go back to the moon. We want to go on to Mars. We had been working with, with other nations around the world for, geez, probably 20 years now on trying to estab establish some kind of exploration strategy. And, and we produced a document called the Global Exploration Roadmap. And that roadmap said humanity really wants to go all the way out to Mars. And so we've been working now for decades to try to figure out how do we get humans to Mars. We came to one conclusion, and it was we were not going to go there on a space shuttle because the space shuttle wasn't designed for deep space exploration. It was designed to be a mode of transportation from Earth to low Earth orbit and back, to go to a platform, an orbiting space station, deliver people and parts, and come back. And so it did that for 30 years, and it did it incredibly well. But if we were going to go back to the moon and on to Mars, we needed a new kind of vehicle. And we found out that, you know, we've been working with American industry for all this time. They make incredible vehicles. Why are we telling them how to build them and then trying to take them and operate them ourselves? Why don't we just let them do that and we'll buy the service? So it was a different model. And by doing so, it would cost less for NASA. NASA could then devote more money to building spacecraft that would be able to take us back to the moon and onto Mars. And that's the agreement we made with the private sector. You build us spacecraft, we'll buy the service from you. We'll produce the spacecraft that's going to take humans and things to deep space. And then as we, as we refine those areas and settle them and make sure that it's okay to operate out there, you can follow us along. along. And as much as commerce can stand, you know, as much as it's good for your business, you can begin to operate successively in these areas that we've already explored. So we're trying to hand low Earth orbit off to commercial entities. This was one of the first vehicles we started using. It's now owned by the company Northrop Grumman. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a commercial cargo vessel called Cygnus, and it goes to space on a Russian, with Russian rocket engines and a Ukrainian rocket uh, in, in, on a, in a vehicle made by the Italians. So it's an internationally produced uh, rocket that's run by an American company. So that's one form of doing it. We had another company, SpaceX, which is, uh, whoa, I got too carried away there. Let me go back. SpaceX, an American company from Hawthorne, California, did it a different way. They built their own parts. They built their own engines. They built all the parts of the rocket. And so they have what's called the SpaceX Dragon. This was a, a dramatic change in the way we did business. This was a business revolution or an innovation in business and they started driving the cost of going to space down which was really important because that was one of the things we wanted to do was get the cost of going to space as as low and low and lower as we could so that more and more people could involve could enjoy the opportunity to go and and that's that's one of the things that SpaceX did they were they were a transformative organization that came in with a different business model uh, this was our partner for a long time now since um, geez more than 20 years, we've been working with the Russian space agency, Roscosmos, and they provide a vehicle that can carry three crews to space at a time, and they provide the, the transportation for our crews to go to the International Space Station. After the Columbia accident, we were told that we needed to finish construction of the station and phase the space shuttle out, and the best way to do that, we thought, was to take the construction crews up on the space shuttle, where we could take seven crew members at a time, and, uh, and then let the Russians carry the, the operating crew for the space station so that we could do two things at once. So, so the Russians got our crew that lived and worked on station, and we carried the construction crews that went up for short periods of time and finished building out the International Space Station. We finished it in 2010 and retired the shuttle in 2011, and then turned to the commercial entities like Northrop Grumman and SpaceX. Um, then 
we had other partners from other countries, the Japanese with the HTV. It's the largest cargo module we have today. We have the Europeans have a module called the ATV. There's another vehicle that's getting ready to come online, and it's done by a company called Sierra Nevada. This is, its nickname is the Dream Chaser, and I like it because I'm a pilot, and it has wings. And so with this one, as opposed to the capsules that come back and land in the ocean or land out in the desert somewhere, this one we can do just like we did with the space shuttle. We can go to space, come back in, do our reentry, circle over here at a runway and land on the runway. So we can, in the event that we have some major catastrophe and we have a major medical emergency for a crew member, we could get them back in a matter of two hours. We can't do that with a capsule. So this is something that I think is going to be very beneficial to us once it's perfected. Now we've gotten, we're pretty settled with the commercial cargo program. We've been doing that for a number of years, ever since about 2013, 2014. And it's very successful, very efficient. Now we're turning to trying to finish the certification of a crew, uh, commercial crew program. So some of you watched this past weekend as SpaceX launched the Crew Dragon, which is a crew module that they want to certify for human space flight autonomously or all by itself it launched, flew up, rendezvoused with the International Space Station, kept its place there right next to the International Space Station at 17,500 miles an hour, just to demonstrate that it could stabilize and everything. And then we cleared SpaceX to let it come on in, and the Dragon flew itself, docked physically with the International Space Station. And so it sits there today. It'll be there a few more days. And then we're going to undock it, bring it back to Earth, let it do a, hopefully a safe reentry, and then we'll do a recovery, make sure we look at all the data. I think everything's going to be okay. And the next time it flies, it'll actually have a crew on it, a crew of four that will go to space by the end of this year. So we'll then have commercial crew uh, access available with companies like SpaceX with the Crew Dragon and Boeing with the CST-100 Starliner, Boeing will fly their test hop, test flight, sometime later uh, this spring, probably April or May, and then hopefully before the end of the year, they'll fly their first crewed flight, also with, with a crew of four. So we will we'll, we'll be in a much better shape when we do that. There's a potential partner for us. Today, because of congressional prohibitions in the US, we can't work collaboratively with the, with the Chinese in human space flight. We work with them in aeronautics and science, but not in human space flight. And so one of these days, we're going we're gonna to get Congress to, to kind of cancel that prohibition, and we'll work cooperatively with them, just like we do with Russia and the European Space Agency and ISRO and everybody. Um, the advantage that it gives you is it's one more vehicle that has the capability of safely carrying humans to space and bringing them home, because today, there are only three nations that have ever carried people to space. It's been the US, China, and Russia. And so um, this vehicle is very much like the Russian Soyuz. Uh, there is now a platform called Tiangong that's the beginning of their space station. So we'd, we'd love to have them as a partner so we have another way to go to space. Um, these are some of the things that some of you are going to have an opportunity to do. Remember I said earlier that I encourage all of you to try to, if you have an interest in it, um, Try to figure out a way that you can get involved in the space program, whether it's as an astronaut or whether it's as a person that's working on, on projects like in-space manufacturing or advertising, believe it or not. We're, now that we have commercial entities carrying people and things to space, uh, they've got to make money somehow. And so as NASA, we couldn't do it. You know, the federal government can't advertise. But that doesn't stop a commercial company. So, so NASA's working with the private, in, private entities now saying, OK, we're going to let you advertise on our vehicle, but here are some of the rules and here are some of the limitations. But you're going to see marketing and advertising coming on spacecraft. Uh, developing new technologies that are needed to make it possible for life here on Earth to be, more, to be better. Uh, to be more healthy, to be safer. So we do a lot of biomedical research that's not only good for the astronauts, but more particularly is very good for us back here on Earth. An example would be osteoporosis. Some of you are familiar with, with the disease. It's, it, it, and it, it affects women much more than men, but it, it affects everybody. And usually with age, your bones get brittle uh, because you're, you're starting to lose calcium and potassium and other minerals. Um, the same condition occurs to an astronaut in space in a matter of days. It doesn't take years. So we can simulate the kind of activity that happens in the human body here on Earth over a lifetime. And, and we find that the big thing is lack of exercise, lack of stress and strain on the body, 
uh, and maybe you need some um, medicinal supplements or, or supplement your diet. So with the astronauts on board the International Space Station, I showed you some of the exercise apparatus that we use. That's the way that we found a way to combat conditions that are similar to osteoporosis, keep our astronauts healthy. When they come back today, they, bone mass is good, muscle mass is good. What's the most important muscle in the body? Huh? The heart. That's the one we we'll worry about more than anything else. When you go into space and you're in the microgravity environment, the heart doesn't have to work at all because the blood kind of just flows naturally around the body. You end up uh, with fluid shift happens immediately. As soon as the main engine's cut off and, and gravity matches out, centrif you know, civil, centrifugal force matches our gravity, we begin to float. And the fluids in your body seek equilibrium. So all this fluid that's pulled in your lower extremities down here on Earth goes, comes up and you have a big headache because you have too much fluid in your head. So you do something really simple. Over the first couple of days, you go to the bathroom and you urinate out about two liters of fluid that you don't need. When you get ready to come back to Earth, you drink that much water so that you rehydrate yourself, but you don't need all that fluid while you're out in space. So another thing that we found. So, um, but we were talking a little bit about uh, or I was getting to what I think for astronauts tends to be the most fun. And that's interacting with students like you through education and outreach. Most of the astronauts will spend at least an hour a day in front of a camera doing real live downlink TV to a classroom somewhere in the world. So outreach is in the part, education and outreach on the part of the astronauts is a really critical part of what they do. So now, what's the plan? So here's the plan. And for 20 plus years now, nations around the world, in excess of 25 nations, have been coming together to meet and to talk about what, what's the appropriate path for humanity for the future when we talk about space exploration. And over that period of time, we always keep coming back to the fact that our ultimate destination for humanity is Mars. So we want to go to Mars. Why? Because Mars is very much like Earth, or at least used to be. We think it used to be a temperate planet. It used to have lots of water, and uh, then something happened several, maybe billion years ago, and it's, it's, it lost its magnetosphere, its protective shell, and its, its atmosphere began to be scraped off, turned into this cold, bitter planet that it is today, and we want to know why. We think there's life on Mars, not like you and me, not intelligent life, but we think we may find signs of microbial life, which would be really important because it means then we have the, the basic building blocks for our own construction material, if you will, for making concrete or making other kinds of things. We've actually done that in, uh, in the laboratory at Stanford University in California. We make something called biobricks, using uh, microbes as the base and simulant from Martian soil and actual lunar soil that we brought back from the moon. So those are some of the things we want to do. Food, we want to make our own food. We want to grow it or maybe we print it using 3D printing, but, but having some microbes that, that are there on the planet when you go makes it a lot easier because you don't have to take all that with you. So that's what we're doing in low Earth orbit today. But we're ready to hand this over to commercial entities, commercial and international partners, while NASA and our other international partners move out and, and resume working on the surface of the moon with humans as well as robots. We never left the moon. We've still been exploring the moon, but we've been doing it robotically and remotely using sat orbiting satellites and landers and the like. Now, we're going to spend about t uh, 10 years, the decade of the 20s, working in cislunar space, putting humans on the surface of the moon again, and getting ready to make sure that technically we're ready to send humans to Mars. So we've been studying Mars for 50 years with robotic spacecraft. We really know the planet. Um, we're comfortable that we understand its radiation environment, that we understand how to live there. Uh, you know, you've got to create life support systems and the like. You're not going to go walking outside on Mars and take a big breath of fresh air and all that stuff. You take your helmet off and do that and you're dead. So um, we don't want to do that. But we do want to live and work on Mars. So we're, we're, we're getting ready to do that. So that's, that's the plan. If you want to read some more about it in detail, go online, look for the Global Exploration Roadmap or the GER, GER, the Global Exploration Roadmap, and you'll see that there are several versions of it going all the way back to 2009 or 2008 
where many nations of the world came together to, to try to put this roadmap together. And, and so that'll show you what we're getting ready to do. Where we're going from low Earth orbit is NASA and our partners are now working on something that's called the, the Lunar Orbit Gateway. It's an orbiting platform that we can use to bring crews from Earth, put them in the platform. Some of them who want to go work on the surface of the moon will go down on a lander, come back, and then get back onto their transfer vehicle to come back to Earth. And, uh, and some of them will work on the lunar orbiting get gateway for a while, get in another spacecraft, go to Mars, and come back. And so this will be sort of like the bus station or the train station or whatever it is in lunar orbit. And that's, that's the way this is going to be used. And you'll see this start actually being constructed here in the next few years. NASA and our partners are working on that. And eventually, uh, what we're going to do is go, to, go back to the moon and on to Mars. And I'm going to show you what's going on right now. We're actually building hardware. We're not, there's nothing on a drawing board anymore. We are building hardware. We're testing hardware to, for the vehicle. NASA's big heavy lift launch vehicle is, doesn't have a name yet. We call it the SLS, the, the Space Launch System. It's the most powerful rocket that we've ever had. And so that's what we want to use. And it's going to take a module that's called the Orion Crew Module. We actually flew Orion into space in 20, December of 2014. We wanted to demonstrate three things. We could communicate with it, and it could hear us that it could respond to the commands that we sent autonomously, and that it could safely come back to Earth. It could survive orbit in the radiation envir of environment of orbit around the moon, come back safely to Earth, so that if we had a humans on board, they would have survived. And we demonstrated that we could do that. So that's, that's what happened when we sent Orion uh, into space in December of 2014. Now, if I can get this to work, I'm, OK, I'll let you watch this. So most of the summit will be artist concepts, but most of it is real live hardware that's in test, has been tested, or has been flown. These are what I was talking about, the shuttle main engines. Uh, we've taken them out of storage, refurbished them, uh, put new main engine controllers on them, and those are what are going to power SLS. Those are modified shuttle solid rocket boosters. We added a whole segment to give them more power, and so they've been tested out in the desert in, in Utah. This is a shroud that covers the, uh, the Orion crew module to protect it during the ascent when it goes into space, and that showed it testing to see how it falls away to make sure it falls away safely. That's actually part of Orion being assembled and tested down at the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. And what you're going to see coming up, right after this vehicle separates in the cartoon, you'll see, you're actually going to see an image looking out of the pilot's window right here. That's the way if you were sitting in the cockpit, you would look at, at your thermal protection shield burning away around you to protect you. We, we let the thermal shield burn away so that the crew module doesn't overheat and burn up and you die. So it's real important for that, for that to happen. I know you see, you see the fire and you go, ooh, ooh, that's not good. That's good because it's the thermal protection system's burning up. Uh, we have partners around the world. Today, NASA has in excess of 800 interna active international agreements with more than 120 countries. And ISRO is one of those countries uh, that has a number of active agreements with us. Um, we're in the process right now of signing another agreement that says we're going to collaborate or cooperate um, in helping you to establish your human spaceflight program. So before you ask me, you don't want to go to NASA to become an astronaut. You want to stay right here in India and you want to go to school, and you want to get your degree, and you want to go to work for ISRO, or you want to go to work for one of the Indian companies that's going to help them stand up their human spaceflight program so you can become an Indian astronaut, represent India, and work with all, the, all your NASA counterparts. So you don't have to go anywhere. You can do it right here. But you're going to have to insist. You're going to have to ask when you go to college. You're going to have, have to ask your professors, hey, I want to do some research, and I want to do some research in space. And the professors will have to go over to ISRO and say, hey, can you talk to NASA and our other partners and find out how I get my experiment, my students' experiment, 
if it's still there on the International Space Station, because it'll be there until 2024, 2028, but then it goes away. And what we want to happen is countries like India or France or Germany or anywhere builds smaller modules or private companies that we put into space to replace the International Space Station. And on those modules, we do very specific experimentation, like pharmaceuticals development, materials processing, biomedical research. So you don't have to have a big, giant, expensive facility like the International Space Station. So, so that's what we're looking to do. How many of you saw the movie Hidden Figures? OK, did you like it? It was awesome. So those of you whose hands didn't go up, who haven't seen Hidden Figures, go online, look at Netflix or something. It is a phenomenal movie because it's a movie about us, about all of us, humanity. And it's a movie about the victory of the, of the human spirit over adversity. These were women who, in the early days of the space program, were relegated to the back room to, do, to become human computers. This was before the days of a, of a Mac or you know, a Dell or an IBM PC. This was before we even had the big UNIVAC. We didn't have any computers. And so people by hand did all the calculations to send spacecraft into space. This woman, who turned 100 years old this past August, is Katherine Johnson. And when it came time to try to send humans to the moon, we didn't know how to do it. When President Kennedy went before the Congress of the United States and then went out to Houston, Texas and stood in the stadium of Rice University and said, in the next nine years, before this decade is over, we are going to send a man to the moon and bring him safely back to Earth. What he knew and what we knew, but what the rest of America and the world didn't know is, we didn't know how to do that. We had no clue. We didn't know how to do it at all, but again, the spirit of, the hum of humanity. We went back and figured it out. And people like Katherine Johnson helped us to get you know, the last mile, to get over the final hurdle in, in making the, doing the calculations that told us, if we've got a vehicle that's in Earth orbit, how do we get it safely get it out of Earth orbit? How do we get it going fast enough that it breaks the bonds of gravity, starts heading toward the moon, slows down in time to get captured by the moon's gravity and drawn into lunar orbit and stays there long enough for us to have astronauts get in their lunar lander, go down to the surface of the moon, come back up to the lander successfully, and then come back to Earth and get out of moon, lunar orbit, back into Earth orbit, and safely back to Earth. And so that's one of the things that Katherine Johnson did. So you know, space flights uh, wait for him all the time but the flights down here don't. So he has to leave uh, in a hurry. Uh, in spite of his busy schedule, uh, he uh, made it, he presented himself, and he made a wonderful presentation. And I must say that all the young minds sitting here, they have been emboldened by your presence and presentation. And I'm sure many of them would take to realizing their own dreams of flying into space and coming back safely. So thank you very much for an inspiring talk.